Hello and welcome to today's Enviro School professional learning session. And today we're once again focusing on water as we learn about state and federal protections for water quality under the Clean Water Act, which turns 50 years old today, October 18th, 1972 is when the Federal Clean Water Act was enacted. So we are exactly 50 years out and we're very excited about that. So we're gonna start you off with a, just a really short little pump up video to get you excited about the Clean Water Act, and then I'll introduce our presenters. Join. Oh, sorry, I paused it. Join Eagle in celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. The water that we protect around us connects us all to each other. That water that flows by you on your local river walk is the same water that you splashed in at your favorite lake as a child. That's why it's so important that we take care of Michigan's lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands. As the sun sets on your next water adventure, take a moment to reflect on the law that has safeguarded our water resources for 50 years. Learn more and celebrate with us at michigan.gov slash CWA50. Gov slash CWA50. Right. Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> I am going to pause my sharing a minute. All right. As we Oh boy, sorry, my computer keeps trying to share its sound. <laughs> I don't usually have that problem. Um, let's see, I'm going to invite our staff to go ahead and turn their cameras on a minute while I try to get my video out of full screen here so that I can advance it. Oh, there we go. Okay, sorry guys. I don't usually have this much trouble with my screen. Okay, I'm back, I'm back. Okay, so here we have our presenters for the day. Hopefully you're all excited about learning about the Clean Water Act. Uh, we have four awesome folks from our Water Resources Division here to share their expertise with you. We've got Chris Alexander from our permit section, who is gonna be presenting along with Kevin Goodwin on the history um, and where the Clean Water Act came from and how it applies in Michigan, as well as what some of our surface water assessment programs look like. And then we have Julia Kirkwood, who some of you maybe even are, have interacted with and know, uh, talking about our non-point source program, which is that really big watershed perspective that a lot of us um, have educated on for a long time in Michigan. And then we're going to end up with Kate, Kate Kirkpatrick talking about um, what makes Michigan special as far as our wetland program. So we're pretty excited about all that. And with that, I am going to turn it over to... Um, Chris and Kevin to go ahead and start their part of the presentation. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. I'm Chris Alexander and I manage permit section in the water resources division within the uh, permit section within water resources division within Eagle. I'm responsible for the oversight of just under 60 professional staff responsible for a wide variety of programs. Today, we'll focus on the programs implemented under the Federal Clean Water Act. And Eagle has given several webinars that are going to that focus a little bit more in detail. Today is just a high level overlook. So you can look up those other webinars if you're interested in more detail. And what a great talk to give on the actual anniversary of the Federal Clean Water Act. Next slide, please. I'm going to give a high level overview of the history of the Clean Water Act and the amendments, the basic goals of the act, and then I'll mention some of the more common programs implemented under the act. And then I'll hand the presentation over to Kevin, who's going to talk to us about water quality standards. Many of you have probably heard at some point or another about rivers starting on fire due to pollution. The 1960s was a time when pollutants of all types from the Industrial facilities were dumped into rivers and streams without any type of treatment. The same was said for human sewage that was also, also discharged without treatment. Significant pollutant events prompted 
public outcry um, because of the, the conditions of this, the nation's waters. Rivers and streams were toxic to fish and not fit for recreation. These events prompted the first Earth Day in 1970, followed by major amendments to the Federal Clean Water Pollution Control Act. It's worth noting that some of these pollution events from this time period are still being cleaned up today. Next slide. Unfortunately, this was a common site during prior to the establishment of the Federal Clean Water Act. Next slide. The 1972 amendments were the start of the recovery of the nation's waters. The amendments established the National Pollutant Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Permit Program. This is what most people understand as point source discharges. That is those pipes that discharge directly to rivers, lakes, and streams. Anyone proposing to discharge a pollutant into waters of the state or waters of the United States must have a valid permit first. Michigan has long been a delegated state to de develop, issue, and enforce National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permits for many types of wastewater discharges. Next slide. The Clean Water Act amendments set standards for industry known as treatment technology controls and require development of water quality standards for contaminants in surface water. The premise of technology requirements were to establish a national pollutant control requirement for each industrial category was based on the best technology that the industry could afford. And it was meant to level the playing field no matter where the industry was located. So for example, a coal-fired power plant using surface waters to cool their process, their process water located in Minnesota would have to meet similar requirements if that industry was located in Michigan. Water quality, unlike the technology controls, is protected by evaluating the site the site-specific conditions of the receiving water. The amendments also funded the construction of sewage treatment plants using grant funding, and it recognized the need for planning to address critical problems posed by non-point source pollution. Non-point source pollutants are more diffuse in nature and harder to control. Next slide, please. I would be remiss if I didn't share the formal goal of the, of the Clean Water Act to restore and maintain the physical and chemical and biological integrity of the nation's waters. There are many regulatory layers to restoring and maintaining the nation's waters. A few of the better known goals are to eliminate pollutant discharges by 1985. I think we can all agree that we're still working on that one. To achieve an interim water quality goal of all waters to be fishable and swimmable and to prohibit the discharge of toxic pollutants in toxic amounts just to name some of the more common ones. I mentioned the technology in the previous slide to eliminate pollutants. And also we'll hear more about non-point source pollution controls later in the presentation. How do we regulate national uh, permits using the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Program? There are many types of permits and, and I'm sure you're aware of, of or have experience with some of them. Wastewater treatment plants, like the a local wastewater treatment plant, many of you may be served by industrial facilities, large scale animal feeding operations, pesticides where pesticides are, are applied uh, near and above waters, and also different types of stormwater pollution, or excuse me, storm, stormwater permitting for municipal, industrial, and construction stormwater. These permits regulate pollutant discharges to waters of the state to meet technology requirements and protect water quality. Kevin, I, I think the next, I think our slide may have been missed, put out of order. Can you scroll up for me? Okay. Well, we're gonna we're gonna go with it. Um, I'm gonna have you scroll down. If you could keep going. Um, <clears throat> I don't think we have the latest uh, presentation here. I don't know. Sorry. All 
right? Um, Do you want me to pull up the one that I've yeah, got I, on here? Okay. Yes, I think we're having technical difficulty here. You are the overview. Okay. <clears throat> All right, folks. <laughs> Sorry about this. That's okay. Oh, that's Kate's presentation. I will go from the beginning. Uh, I think that's it. Is that it, Chris? Yes, sir. Oh, there you go. Great. Okay. You beat me to it, Kevin. All right. Sorry, guys. <laughs> go for okay. it. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so this is what Clean Water Act permitting covers on the ground. Many thousands of individual and general permits for a wide variety of sectors. These are examples. We have 300 plus large animal feeding operation permits, over 90 different types of pesticide permits, 300 municipal separate storm sewer system permits, and many, many thousands, just under 3,000 different industrial stormwater permits, as well as around 1,000 uh, construction stormwater permits as well. Many of you may be familiar with municipal storm sewer system permits at, at your area schools. Next slide, please. The 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act is something to celebrate, but our work isn't done. We are encountering different problems than in the past due to climate change, emerging pollutants, and excessive nutrients in our surface waters, just to name a few. Rising water levels and more intense storm events have tested the ability of critical infrastructure that we've relied on to treat pollution over the years. The photos on this slide represent issues that we are dealing with today. The photo on the top left is an algal bloom in a lake. These situations can produce toxins that are harmful to humans and animals. Per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, also known as PFAS, is a class of pollutants found in our state and around the nation. The chemicals have been used around the world over the last century in manufacturing, firefighting, in household and consumer goods. Then the picture in the lower left is a combined sewer overflow. This is a situation where sanitary sewage and stormwater are transported in the same pipe. Large storm events prevent all of this flow from getting to the wastewater treatment plant for proper treatment and causing it to either discharge partially or fully untreated to our surface waters. Next slide, please. I showed you a wide variety of facilities that are regulated under the Clean Water Act and that we have more work to do, but all of us can play a role in clean water. Small efforts from citizens can help protect water quality every day. Many of you have probably seen examples that, of pollution that have a high likelihood of getting into our rivers and lakes. The example in the top right shows excessive salt use on the sidewalk in the winter. And the photo on the left shows an oil sheen and dirt and other particles that make their way into a stormwater catch basin, which ultimately leads directly to a river or a stream. Both instances show a connection to how our activities impact water quality every day. Next slide. I'm first going to thank you for your patience while we worked out our technical difficulties. And at this point, I'm going to hand the presentation over to Kevin, who's going to walk us through how we protect our water quality standards. Thank you, Chris. All right, we'll see if we can keep this working smoothly. Watch, since I'm now in control of it, it'll work smoothly for me, and I'll have to buy Chris lunch someday. Um, so thanks for the handoff. Uh, as Chris has already kind of touched on, the amendments to the 1972 uh, Clean Water Act focused on things like establishing a national pollutant discharge elimination system program, setting wastewater standards. Uh, but one of the really important components that I'm going to discuss um, was the need for states and tribes with the authority to develop water quality standards. And so and this is going to be what's required for all surface waters in all states. The water quality standards essentially translate into uh, a set of rules, a document that uh, is comprised of three main parts. And, and people often describe it as a three-legged stool because without any one of these parts, it really kind of falls down. Uh, and, and I'll discuss each one of these uh, just a little bit here. Um, the first one being designated uses. 
I simply, when I talk about this to people, I describe this as sort of the values that we place that we place on water and water quality. Um, and that's both for things that include kind of utilitarian values, um, ways we use it in industry and agriculture, but also recreational values and subsistence, subsistence values, um, as well as things like just sort of um, inherent values, sort of the ecology of the system, the ability for our waters to support um, vibrant um, aquatic ecosystems. And so these are what we call our designated uses. So this is really the, the primary um, focus of most of our water quality protection work uh, is to make sure that these uses are supported and where they're not supported, that they can be, we can work towards returning them uh, to such conditions that they can be supported. And so these are all, again, the kinds of things that you think of, the, the values that you place on the ability to go out and um, enjoy uh, the amazing water resources that we have here in Michigan. It's the obvious things like fishing, um, swimming, wading, that sort of stuff. But some of the things that um, folks don't often think of is the ability for our waters to support industry. Um, we often talk about, um, you know, concerns over how industry and things like that impact water quality. Well, the same goes into those systems as well. Um, most of the, many of these industries use water in some way in their productions and the water has to be a certain quality even for them to use it. Just like it needs to be a certain quality for agriculture to put it on their fields and things like that. So water quality can mean many different things depending on the kind of use that you're concerned with protecting. And we need to protect basically all of these uses in all of our waters in Michigan. So another leg of the stool is criteria. So we have designated uses and then we have criteria and the criteria are sort of the, um, the thresholds, the, the, the things that we're trying to achieve either above or below which we know that harm may come to the water quality. And these are, I'm just giving a couple quick examples. They come in a narrative form and they come in a numeric form. And the narrative form is literally just that. It sort of describes a condition that we want to maintain or we want to avoid, depending on the perspective. Um, the one I, I give here is what we call typically our free from. You know, water quality should be free from these kinds of things, turbidity, foam, solids, um, in such unnatural quantities that they might impact those uses. So that's a free from description. Doesn't give you a real number or any kind of volume. It just says, this is sort of a condition that we want to avoid. Um, the flip side of that are numeric uh, criteria. These are the ones I think that are more intuitive to people when they think of um, worrying about pollution in a stream. They're often thinking about toxic chemicals and wanting to make sure that we are below certain conditions um, in those toxic chemicals, poor microorganisms, things like that. Um, but there's, it's actually a number. So we've established through understanding how these affect aquatic organisms or how these affect people and their health, uh, we can identify an actual threshold, a number that's used as a numeric kind of cutoff um, that we want to maintain to maintain those uses. So we have both narrative numeric criteria that kind of join together to support those designated uses. Third important component of uh, water quality standards is what's called anti-degradation. And essentially in a nutshell, that means we, water conditions should only go in one direction, and that's better. Um, we shouldn't be going backwards. And so if it's good enough to support all the uses that we value in our waters, then we need to maintain it there. And if it's not, we need to restore those conditions. Uh, and so anti-degradation just sort of tries to confirm that notion that we're not stepping backwards in this process, we're gonna to continue to move forward. So I work in a group uh, of folks um, in our water resources division who one of our big charges is monitoring and assessment of water quality around the state. So this means we get to go out in streams and lakes and wetlands and, and take a look at them and, and kind of understand whether or not those uses are being supported or not. Um, so we've got folks, biologists, engineers, um, we've got people with all sorts of varied uh, backgrounds in environmental science and aquatic entomology and fisheries and chemistry that work in this group that go out and help uh, do this work. We also contract a lot of the work done through contractors. We do pass through grants for some of it. So there's a lot of folks working on this monitoring program because again, Michigan's got over 11,000 lakes, 76,000 miles of rivers and streams, countless wetlands and Great Lakes shoreline to monitor and try to understand what water quality is like around the state. Ultimately, we take that information then and have to compile it and understand um, what it, the story it tells us in terms of it's whether or not those uses are being supported we use the data that we collect, we compare it to those criteria, the narrative, the numeric criteria. We try to understand whether or not um, our uses are supported. If they are, that's great news. If they're not, 
then those are focus areas that we should be working on to restore that, um, restore those conditions. I can't help put some of these slides in, these are self-serving. Um, so I've gotten a chance with my career to do some amazing things. And this is a, a, a pretty, it's like holding a dinosaur here. This was my wife and I uh, getting a chance to work with the DNR on some, uh, some, some long line fishing for sturgeon uh, on the uh, St. Clair River. So pretty remarkable things. Any chance I get to throw a bragging slide up, I'll do that. Uh, the kinds of things we monitor around the state are very varied. Um, we're looking at things like pathogens, and that's, we are, local health departments doing this because these are the kinds of uh, things that we look for when we're worried about going to a beach and whether or not you can swim safely. Um, that's the monitoring that's done by local health departments. We do that also in rivers and streams around the state, try to get an understanding of pathogen conditions around the state and the ability to recreate safely. Uh, a number of us do a lot of work on biological assessments. This is fish, macroinvertebrates, the critters that live in the stream. Uh, we go all over the state every year looking um, and doing surveys on this kind of information. We gather it. Uh, we've got folks, um, different folks in tribal communities that also have monitoring programs that'll gather this. We can pull the information that's pulled in from that from universities. Anybody who, who does this kind of work, we try to mine that information to help build that story of water quality around the state. We also do water chemistry. That one's a fairly obvious one. It's the one that most people think of when they think of water quality. Uh, we have an extensive water chemistry network, different kinds of sites, different times of the year we're sampling, different intentions behind that sampling. But it allows us to paint pictures of water quality around the state. This example on the right is what we call a heat map. Um, of chloride concentration in streams around the state. So red is higher, green is not. So it gives us an impression of sort of what water quality is like in different areas, makes sense depending on the, the parameter we're looking at um, and how we've uh, affected the land and things like that. But that's the kind of information we can get from this sort of the big broad water chemistry program. We also do an extensive fish contaminant monitoring program. We do that so we can not only assess our, the uses that we talked about for fish consumption, the ability to go out and eat fish, but this information also helps um, Department of Health and Human Services create their fish consumption guidelines, those sorts of um, suggestions for folks to be able to pay attention to if you want to not just fish, but also eat fish and do it safely and do it, um, you know, so that you've got your health in mind as well. We also monitor all kinds of stuff. I and mean, we monitor sediment conditions. We monitor things like herring gull eggs and eaglet blood plasma. Uh, we monitor invasive species, which is a huge issue all over the state. Um, and we also reserve the ability to monitor sort of targeted questions. If people have concerns about an area, if they see something going on, um, we try to also create some capacity to be able to answer specific questions about conditions. And that's from anyone in the state can, can submit those sorts of uh, requests to, to have us monitor things. Now, one of the things that may be pertinent to this group um, from an educator standpoint, from a student standpoint, um, even just from a citizen standpoint, is how can other people get involved? We talked a little bit about how those of us who have gone to school for this uh, kind of thing do this on a daily basis. But there are ways that every citizen in the state can be involved in affecting water quality at some level. And it can be as simple as doing stream cleanups and that kind of stuff. Um, just cleaning trash out. And it can be as complicated as, as getting involved with a volunteer monitoring organization and actually doing insect surveys, doing water chemistry monitoring in lakes. Um, I've provided a number of uh, links to different programs, but I just kind of threw a couple opportunities up here just to give an example, like the Clinton River Watershed Council, which is the kind of the boxed um, information there very active watershed group. And we have a number of very active, very well-organized watershed groups in this state. They're great places to start, great resources to get a hold of, to figure out how you can plug in or how your students can plug in uh, to working on water quality issues around the state. And so I think this is an, a really important way to connect both kind of citizens to these resources and help. And it's also a way that we can then as professionals in the field, work with these organizations and, and use the information that they're gathering at some level too, to make some of our water quality assessments and join that information so that um, we're trying to make the best use of everybody's effort out there. So blasted through it real quick. Uh, that's sort of our assessment and monitoring side of our program that comes out of our water quality standards. Um, again, one of the big amendments to the Clean Water Act, which as we said, turns 50 today. It's actually pretty awesome. So this is our obligatory ending here, and uh, I will pass it off to whoever the next person is on the group in the room.
Thank you so much, Kevin and Chris. That was great. And I, um, I have some questions for you if no one else does at the end. So you're not going to get off easy. I'm going to seed some because I, I have things that I'm not sure about after hearing that, that I didn't know before. So, um, yeah, feel free to put questions in the chat. We will get to those at the end. I appreciate those. Or if, um, Kevin, you want to address any of those throughout, that's fine too. So I'm going to hand it over next to Julia to talk about non-point source pollution. And this is where I worked for many years. So it's my favorite topic to hear about and talk about. So thank you, Julia. And okay. I'm going to let you go ahead and take it away. Hold on a second. My screen share isn't showing. I have your um, reason. Yeah, if it doesn't show, let me know because I think like it's I showing it. everything except for <laughs> one thing <laughs> I need. Like, hold on a minute. Let, let me just close out a couple things. Let's see. It's probably thinking you have so many things going on. Which thing do you want to share? I have yours up if you yeah. want me to go ahead and share for you. Please do. Because okay. <laughs> That's All really right, just weird. go ahead and let me know so, the, okay. to, to share switch slides. Okay. I will, Got it? Uh, yep. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. All right. I work in the uh, what's, we, what's called the Nonpoint Source Pollution Program, and the title is like Everywhere Pollution. And it And once you start hearing me talk about this, you'll get a better idea of why it's called everywhere pollution um, in a simple terms. Uh, but first, before I jump into that, um, next slide, please. Um, let me just kind of give, um, uh, provide a little perspective of what we're even talking about in terms of where we're talking. And before I jump into, um, thanks uh, Kevin and Chris for setting this up in such, such a great way because all of what um, Kevin talked about in terms of the monitoring especially really sets the stage for what our program is working on as well. So in terms of a watershed, if you haven't heard that term, if you haven't really thought about what that is, um, it's really kind of an area of land that where all the water drains into a specific water body. And it could be a very large wa uh, watershed, or it could be a very uh, a small watershed and everyone lives in a watershed. And you could actually, you know, back it off and you could say you actually live in multiple watersheds as well. See, next slide, please. So for example, in terms of watersheds, this is a large, um, our large, huge watersheds, um, all the different colors for the Great Lakes basins. So for example, if you're in like a green area in Michigan, all of the water that, or the land on that area drains into Lake Huron. The red and orange drains into Lake Michigan. So you would actually live in Lake Michigan, but what river do you live, river watershed do you live in? It, and then it could go down to smaller creeks and it could go down to maybe it's a lake that you live on. And in our program too, some of the things that I like to um, say is try to break it down a little bit more too, is particularly in urban areas or lakes, I call them lake sheds, because uh, that breaks it down visually then also from a storm shed as well in terms of where does all your storm water within a particular storm drain system flow from? Uh, so that's kind of like a little mini watershed is a little storm shed. So when I start, start, start thinking about these things and where you are in terms of um, where your property is and where you work, where you live that's, and where you play. Next slide, please. So in terms of a watershed, whatever water is draining into this water body, that water also brings with it other things. And whatever's on that land will come with that water. And depending how close it is to the, to the lake or to the river, um, it could be really strong pollution or it could be a little more diluted. And it comes from everywhere. It comes from parking lots. It comes from your driveways. It comes from your lawns. It comes from constructions. It comes from bare fields, um, fertilizers, manure. Uh, so 
once you see, you can't, I always say, once you see, you can't not see. So as you drive around and particularly when it is raining, start seeing where that water is going, if it's going into a particular storm drain or if it's running down a road and into a creek or into a wetland. And then also look what, see what that water looks like. Is it really dirty? Is there like gasoline or oil in it? And recognize that that is going into any lake, river, or stream. And ultimately, we'll end up in our Great Lakes at some point. And it can also go into our groundwater, which most of, uh, many of us use for drinking water supply. Next slide, please. Um, what, you skip one. Oh, there we go. Okay, so when I mentioned about seeing things, looking at these kind of things where you might just be going by and just like, oh, it's been there. Well, then just start seeing like, oh, that's a direct conduit to my lake. That's a direct conduit to my river or to my creek um, or to the storm drain. Like this bottom left-hand picture, that's a storm drain taking a lot of sediment. And ultimately that could go directly into a lake or a river. Uh, next slide, please. So the other thing that we talk about is also not just what's running off the land in terms of pollutants. We also look about look at the amount of water. The volume of water has increased significantly because of impervious surfaces. And what happens to that is it changes the system a lot. And this graphic we like to use to just show that how it changes when you have so much impervious surface. And the more impervious surface that you have, the more runoff you are going to have and the less that you're going to have that actually infiltrates into the ground. Uh, next slide, please. And what that looks like on the land is our rivers are changing completely. And you can see how there's a lot of erosion. It increases erosion. And we refer to this as term as like flashiness. All of a sudden you get this huge amount of water blowing out a system and continually blowing out the system. Um, the system wasn't designed to hold that. Um, this also affects loss of wetlands where you have these huge sponges of wetlands just holding this water in place. And all of a sudden, if you think about it, you squeeze that sponge and the water leaves that sponge. And that's what um, draining wetlands does is it removes the sponge system and puts all that water into, our, into a drain or into a creek or a river. Um, so that so we also look at not just what's running off the land, but the amount of water as well. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is in 1987. Um, Clean Water Act um, created that was created what's we refer to as Section 319, and a lot of people you'll hear people talk, oh, we'll talk about oh, section 319, section 319. Well, this refers to the non-point source pollution. And basically, um, states were directed to, hey, you have to do something about all of this polluted runoff. It's everywhere pollution. It's non-regulated. Um, there are no permits for this. And over the years, there have been more things that have become permitted, like Chris mentioned, um, CAFOs, the agriculture. These large feeding at, uh, operations used to not be permitted. Well, now they are. Um, a lot of areas, these highly urbanized areas for the municipal um, storm sewer, they are permitted now, where previously that was considered um, non-point source. So we do deal with all, everything that's not permitted for the most part in terms of runoff, and it's very challenging. We also have to prepare a management plan, and we get some funding to do that as well, which we do through um, pass-through grants a lot. Okay. Next slide. So my little um, elevator speech about how, what our program does is we work with communities and in, in collaboration with different um, partners throughout the state to restore and protect our rivers and lakes. And our priority is restore these impaired water bodies. And it could be from um, water 
runoff. It could be from sediment. It could be like because there's algae blooms. And Keva mentioned um, the designated uses. If a water body is not meeting a specific designated use related to a non-point source pollution problem, that becomes an impaired water body. And that becomes our priority to be focusing and working in collaboration with partners. Second one, or ne next slide, please. So the next piece is that we want to keep our healthy waters healthy. So we focus on working with different partners to try to identify where are our priorities for keeping these waters healthy. And there are multiple ways that we, we can do that. But the main, next slide, please. The, what, the approach we take in terms of collaboration is watershed planning. And we work with communities uh, through, there's a lot of pass-through grants and a lot of organizations at the local levels that are, are, are leading these efforts and watershed planning and creating a plan for your, their watershed on a large scale, small scale, and then implementing those plans. Next slide, please. And what that looks like is basically you're going out and you're looking at what's out in that watershed. What type of watershed you have is going to determine what you're going to be doing. If it's really agriculture, you're going to be doing some different things. And then you identify the sources, causes, and problems, and then you create an action plan in, for implementation to solve these problems. And then as part of that too, we identify the high quality areas that are so unique and um, so lovely that, hey, we want to keep these things healthy. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so and then this is just one example of an implementation project. This actually happens to be on a school pro uh, school property in Kalamazoo. This creek, you know, the every you know, they were just mowing up to the edge for the most part, and there was too much water coming through the system. Um, so there was a bit of a stream uh, restoration, and. Um, it was fairly stable now. They, it's, it's not eroding. The plants have changed a little bit, but this was not a school-led project, but um, it was on school, school property. Next slide, please. So a couple of things that um, schools can do and we're working with um, kids is, uh, how's my waterway? It's a website that on EPA's water, uh, this website, mywaterway.epa.gov, you can go on there and you can find out what's going on in your water watershed. Uh, next slide, please. And then in terms of watershed planning, um, there are a ton of different activities out there for you to work with students and actually going out and I, when I started talking about terms of like lake sheds or storm sheds, I also think about in terms of school sheds. Um, so what, where does your water drain from your school property? And then when it drains into that system, where does that go? Does it just go into a little wetland? Does it go into a little storm basin? Or does it go directly into a creek? And how far away is that creek or river? Um, there are a lot of activities that um, you can use to this one. And I provided this activity to Eileen to provide um, with you as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, uh, whoops. Okay, and then another activity when in terms of implementation, there are um, different things that um, schools can do on their own. And one of these is um, schoolyard rain gardens. This um, whole booklet is um, an activity um, definitely connected to school curriculum and benchmarking is through the Washtenaw County um, Water Resources Commission. It's basically the Drain Commission office in um, Washtenaw County. Um, they have a whole uh, master gardener, rain gardener program that is amazing. And they developed the schoolyard rain gardens. So there's a lot of math in there. And there's even art too, uh, to connect the and mapping and all of these different act types of activities that can be integrated in across, cr across curriculums. And then they can actually implement a project too, if that's what is needed. Okay, and then next slide, please. Uh, this is one uh, little activity that um, I created for um, a, a completely different program that I was working on a few years ago. It's called Tragedy of the Lake. Years ago, there was um, an article called Tragedy of the Commons that was written 
And this, it's connected to that. And basically you have this common resource and everybody wants their own thing. And it's all about me and you take, take, take. And then what happens to the resource? Well, this um, tragedy of the lake um, is a really fun activity. And it's so simple. I mean, you just, I mean, you can, these are the things that I just put together. Um, and you see what happens to the lake um, over time if you totally focus on your perspective. Um, the one thing that I don't have in here, um, but I know um, one of the teachers that went through the program um, ended up taking this and then added more discussion on, on the back end of like, okay, well, how do we solve our problem as a community? What do we do? So that's I um, both, all three of these um, activity um, type things I did provide to Eileen to be able to provide to you as well. So last slide, please. Uh, okay, so again, uh, as a non-point source program, um, we work in a non-regulatory um, environment and it's really about working with communities and how do we partner together to solve this everywhere pollution problem. It takes a lot of time and it takes every one of us to be a part of that solution. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Julia. That was great. A um, lot of good, um, some good discussion in the chat. And I know a lot of you have um, teachers and non-formal educators do, too have done a lot of work in this area. So we're excited to share more and really build out the resources that we're providing to educators through Eagle Classroom as well. So we've heard about the act itself. We've heard about some of the permitting um, and the technical sides of the act, the water quality monitoring. We've learned about how we're managing this, this pollution that's coming from these really diffuse sources. It's not necessarily coming from one single place that you can point at. Um, and now we've got Kate Kirkpatrick is gonna talk about um, one part of the Clean Water Act that's implemented in Michigan in a way that's different than some other states. So I'm gonna let Kate go ahead and take it away and share the exciting information. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound good. Okay, okay so uh, yep, like Eileen said, I'm, I'm gonna kind of give a 10,000 foot view of, of section 404 of the Clean Water Act and, and what makes Michigan one of the special ones when it comes to this section. Uh, my name is Kate Kirkpatrick. I, um, I started working for Eagle in 2019 as a permitter in the resources program. And I recently stepped into this new role as the wetlands policy analyst for the wetland lakes and streams unit in Eagle. Um, so we're gonna dive right into it. So federal jurisdiction over mostly construction activities within our waters partly comes from section 10 of the Federal Rivers and Harbors Act. And that regulates all structures or work in over or under navigable waters of the United States. Um, but we also work within section 404 of the Clean Water Act of 1972, which requires permits for the discharge of dredge or fill material into waters of the United States. And that does include wetlands. And since the mid 1970s, special resources that exist at the interface between land and water have been protected by Michigan's resource program. And these programs protect public trust resources and the surface waters of the state, and it is administered by Eagles Water Resources Division. Numerous statutes are administered by the WRD Water Resources Program. The ones I'm highlighting here today have to do with Michigan's 404 program, which includes Part 301, Inland Lakes and Streams, and Part 303, Wetlands Protection. So Section 404G of the Clean Water Act gives states and tribes the option of assuming or taking over the permitting responsibility and administration of the Section 404 permit program for certain waters. And Section 404 permits for those assumed waters would be issued by the state instead of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. The Corps does retain some permitting authority in the more traditional navigable waters of Michigan, meaning the Great Lakes and connecting water bodies, but Michigan still has permitting requirements. And Michigan is the first of only three states to assume Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. New Jersey and Florida are the other two. Michigan assumed authority in 1984. 
New Jersey in 1994, and Florida most recently in 2020. It is a complicated process to assume authority, but basically a state section 404 program must meet the Federal Clean Water Act standards to protect interstate resources. And the act states that any approved state program shall at all times be conducted in accordance with the requirements of the Clean Water Act. And while states may impose more stringent requirements, they may not impose less stringent requirements. Um, but keeping in mind the 404 permits are issued under state law, so that means that policies and procedures can be more specific to state needs, just as long as they remain federally consistent. EPA and EGLE operate together under what's called a Memorandum of Agreement, which defines each of our roles in administering the 404 permit program. EPA does have oversight over our program and reviews our program to make sure that Michigan is staying consistent with federal regulations. But if EPA ever determines that we aren't staying consistent, then a return to separate state and federal permitting uh, would be required. And hopefully we, we never have to see that happen because Michigan Section 404 program has served as a national model of natural resource protection for nearly 40 years now. Michigan's Wetland Protection Act was written specifically to support state's assumption of the federal Section 404 program. And we did this because uh, states and, and tribal regulators are more familiar with local aquatic resources. We know our own issues and needs. And so by taking over the 404 permit program, Michigan can be more efficient in administering it. It allows us to streamline the review process and reduce unnecessary paperwork and duplication of forms. It reduces delays, saves money for permit applicants, and only a single permit is needed instead of multiple for, for other states where the federal and state permitting programs are, are divided. And it also reduces the potential for conflict between the federal and state permitting conditions. On top of that, Michigan is a water resource heavy state. As you know, our Great Lakes, our inland lakes and streams, our wetlands are incredibly important to Michigan residents in a multitude of ways. And our state laws reflect that. These features on the landscape are highly intertwined isolated wetlands, small streams, large rivers, floodplains associated with all of those. All of these are at play on the landscape, um, as we talked about before, uh, in a lot of different programs administered by the WRD. And through our Section 404 program, we can integrate dredge and fill permitting with traditional water quality programs, such as monitoring and, and water quality standards. So, um, you know, we may have heard of public trust before. What does that mean? Uh, Michigan operates on the public trust doctrine, which basically is the concept that, that certain natural resources are so important to the public that they can't be given purely private ownership and control. So the public trust covers our water resources and these resources are held in trust for the people of Michigan so that they may enjoy navigation, commerce, fishing, other recreation, and this concept is written into our Michigan Constitution and multiple statutes reference the public trust. And Michigan has over 36,000 miles of streams, more than 11,000 lakes and ponds, all that provides fish and wildlife habitat, recreational opportunities, and through part 301, our inland lakes and streams program, and assuming the section 404 permit program, we're able to focus more on riparian rights associated with waterfront properties and protection of public trust resources, which the state of Michigan recognizes as, as our duty to protect for all citizens of Michigan. In part 303, the Wetlands Protection Program protects wetland functions and values by requiring permits for activities within wetlands. And our state assumption of the 404 program also is more protected of wetlands and is something that we, we are able to more consistently provide protection for, even as there, there may be changes at the federal level. And I'm not gonna get into too much detail here, but just know that most of the wetlands in Michigan are regulated at the state level. And some may even be regulated at the local level. 
And if you have questions on how to make determinations on wetlands or whether or not you need a permit, um, you can reach out to me and I can help you with that. But maybe some of you have already come across that uh, just by being a resident of Michigan, living on a lake, uh, having wetlands in your backyard. The Michigan legislature clearly recognizes the benefits of wetlands in terms of functions and values directly in the language of part 303. Our statute recognizes that a loss of wetland may deprive the people of Michigan some or all of the following benefits to be derived from wetland, such as flood and storm control, wildlife habitat, protection of subsurface water resources and groundwater recharge, pollution treatment, erosion control, nursery grounds, and sanctuaries for fish. And people, people do recognize these values. We're serious about our wetland protection because we know the loss of wetland function and values may have far reaching impacts. Something that our permit process considers are cumulative impacts, which looks at the historic loss of wetlands within a watershed and how that contributes to loss of flood storage, water quality, pollution treatment, stream flow maintenance, sediment retention, shoreline stabilization. And so this map here of Michigan is showing pre-settlement wetlands throughout the state. So in green is where those wetlands are still existing as of a 2005 inventory, and the red is where they have been lost, mostly due to human expansion. And you can see Southeast Michigan has lost a lot of wetlands um, since, since pre-European settlement. And these losses and other environmental hazards are often disproportionately affecting communities. I provided a link to our draft environmental justice screening tool to Eileen, um, and that, that tool allows users to explore the environmental health and socioeconomic conditions within a specific community, or you could look more at a region level or across the entire state. And our resource programs also recognize that wetland loss can exacerbate the effects of climate change, which are likely to result in more severe storm events, last year streams, uh, increased flooding problems. And um, you know, as, as uh, Julia was talking about earlier, watersheds that have lost significant wetlands are, are not well suited to adapt to these changes, which is why protection and restoration of wetlands within these watersheds are recommended as some primary climate change adaptation priorities. And so um, wrapping up, I'll, I'll leave you here with, with the benefits of Michigan's Flora 4 program, uh, which takes the requirements of the Clean Water Act and, and provide clear definitions for, um, for regulation in Michigan, faster permit decisions by requiring statutory timeframe for permit review. It consolidates permit requirements, maintains state control while remaining consistent with the federal regulations. Uh, we have local field staff that provide more direct interaction with the applicants. Uh, there's a court style formalized appeal process and a stable predictable regulatory framework and effective resource protection. And we can point to some numbers that demonstrate the effectiveness of these programs and our assumption of section 404. So pre-settlement, Michigan contained 10.7 million acres of wetland, and that number dropped to about 6.5 million acres in 1978. And Michigan currently has uh, 6,465,000 acres of wetland, and that's a total decline of about 41,000 acres since 1978. But since the passage of Michigan's wetland protection laws in 1979, the rate of wetland loss has declined. The rate between 1978 and 1998 was about 1,642 acres of loss per year. And then the rate between 1998 and 2005 was about 1,157 acres of loss per year. And this may not seem like a big deal to some, but this is good news. Um, and I don't have numbers for the last 20 years, but I'll bet that number has been drastically reduced even further, considering the strides we've made in mitigation requirements, our voluntary wetland restoration programs, the staff we've added on, 
the Clean Water Act and our, our state assumption of Section 404 has had significant impacts on resources protection in the state of Michigan. And um, we do still have work to do. We're still in a rate of decline. We are constantly trying to balance change and growth with resource protection. We could always use more staff, more enforcement, more funding. Uh, but when you think about where we would be without these laws in place, hopefully you're, you're able to see the benefits. So I'll leave you there with that sentiment. And that's all I got for you. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Kay. Well, um, that was, I think, a really good segue into some of the resources that I want to go ahead and share on this slide here. Uh, you've heard a lot about the Clean Water Act today. I know that um, for a lot of educators, it's really fun to get outside and get your hands dirty or wet and get in the field looking at wetlands and looking at water quality. And uh, we really want you to do that. We want you to help your students and your audiences experience the Great Lakes ecosystems and all they have to offer and how clean and healthy uh, many of them are as a result of this act. We also want you to be able to talk about, you know, why that's the case. It's really interesting. And I think we can be really proud of the fact that, you know, Michigan is, is a leader in protecting water quality, um, even in so far as we, you know, manage our own wetlands program. Uh, and there's just a real emphasis on water quality and protecting water quality in kind of the culture and discussion of our state. So we can be excited about that. Um, and uh, any of you, if you happen to work alongside a social studies or history teacher, um, and you wanna incorporate some components of the Clean Water Act history into your into your studies that is kind of a neat way to to help frame and understand why we do the things we do uh, in the state of Michigan. So I have up on the screen here just some some curriculum connections that I want to make to some of the things that our staff have said. Julia shared some really awesome uh, activities that I will send out after the webinar today. Uh, I want to point out that we have a few things in Eagle Classroom that really tie in well to the things that were talked about by all of our presenters here. Um, maybe you're aware of our lending station. So we have a bunch of models and activities and resources that you can check out from and borrow from us at no cost and use with your audiences. Um, we have basically every Enviroscape watershed model you've ever heard of. Uh, and some of them focus specifically on watersheds and non-point source pollution to tie in with some of the things that Julia was talking about. Um, the coastal and the ecosystem um, ecological restoration models really pull in a lot of discussion of wetlands and also of um, you know, mitigation of damaged properties to help protect water quality. So those are all cool. And then we also have our very fun H2OQ uh, backpack. So water testing kits that you can borrow from us um, just to kind of try it out and see, see if you like them. Uh, Kate made a really good point uh, about the connections between environmental justice and climate change and wetlands. And I want to just know a few resources we have uh, to help address those as well. The Many of you might be familiar if you're a classroom teacher with the MEEKS curriculum. The MEEKS stands for Michigan Environmental Education Curriculum Support Units. Uh, there is a very well beloved Meeks unit on water quality that has undergone a pretty substantial update and is going to be re released in the spring along with the ecosystems and biodiversity unit. So keep your eyes out for that. Um, our existing Meeks unit uh, geared to sixth grade, sixth to eighth grade is really awesome. And the updated one is going to be able to be used all the way up through high school, which is really cool. And to tie on to that climate piece, we are releasing a new climate change unit next uh, year as well. Uh, we have a climate change unit, but it's getting updated with all the newest information and all the newest state strategies to try to address that. So stay tuned for those and reach out if you're interested and have questions about them. Um, this freshwater education, this water quality education is something that a lot of teachers, a lot of students are working on. And we've been working with our Office of the Great Lakes and the MySTEM network to create a database of freshwater education programs. So if you're looking for somewhere in the state, 
Um, if you're like, who near me talks about water quality, who can help me in my classroom, who can be a community partner, um, check out that freshwater program education database uh, to see who near you you could reach out to as a community partner in addition to Eagle staff. Um, and maybe you're a non-formal educator on the call who's not in that database and wants to be, in which case reach out to me and we'll make sure that you get in there so people know about you. Um, there are a lot of really cool resources. I won't go into too much depth on here because I want to give you all a chance to communicate with each other. Uh, but just know that if you want to learn more about the Clean Water Act itself, that, that website shared at the beginning, michigan.gov slash CWA50, will give you all of the resources that we've been sharing to the general public throughout this month of October. So all the webinars that have been done that go into depth, if you want to like really get into the history and the policy of the act, you can do that. That information is there for you. Um, you can check that out. And then we have a whole water resource education section on Eagle Classroom that has a lot of these things linked to it. Um, and I will share these slides with you as well so you can get all of these resources. I'm gonna go ahead, maybe, I think I'll play. I think I'll play for you this like really short video on our H2OQ backpack if you're interested in water testing since that was one of our comments and then we'll get into our discussion. Hi, I'm Eileen with Eagle Classroom. And today we're gonna to look at what's inside the H2OQ water quality testing backpack that's available to borrow from Eagle's lending station. This backpack is appropriate for students in middle and high school to help understand the health of their local water bodies. Before you begin, always be sure to read all the safety instructions which are located in the front of your binder inside the backpack. You can perform seven different tests using the materials in the H2OQ backpack. This container has your pH meter inside. The pH meter can measure both the pH of the water, which is a measure of how acidic or basic the water is, and it can also measure temperature in degrees Celsius. We also have a meter to measure electrical conductivity. This is a measure of water's ability to pass an electrical current and can help us understand what kinds of ions, including chlorides, are dissolved in the water. Next, we have our nutrient tests. This is our nitrate and our phosphate. These are nutrients that are essential for plants to grow, but too much in the water can cause algae blooms and excess aquatic plants. Our nitrogen test comes with a chemical test kit as well as this little meter that can be connected to an Android device to take a numerical measurement of your result. Your phosphate checker is a little electronic device where you put your sample tube inside and a beam of light reads the sample. Make sure you always check the battery on this device before you head out into the field. Inside the backpack, you'll find several plastic containers. You can use these to store any liquid waste from your chemical tests. This waste can be safely disposed of down the drain when you get back to school or home. Please wash out and dry these containers before you return them to the backpack and return the backpack to the lending station. Next, we have our turbidity tube. Turbidity is a physical measure of how clear the water you're sampling is. This tube comes in your backpack deconstructed. All you have to do is put the three clear pieces together using these connectors. And then when you're finished, you can just take it apart and fit the whole thing in your backpack. The last piece of equipment comes in a separate black carrying case. This is a dissolved oxygen meter, which can be used to measure how much oxygen is in the water, which is necessary for aquatic life. The last things to explore in the backpack are in the front pocket. Inside the front pocket, you have several pairs of gloves, which you would wear while completing any of your chemical tests and also when collecting a water sample if you suspect that your water body has high levels of E. coli. You can also find calibration liquids for your pH and conductivity tests in the front pocket. The final thing to consider before you head out to the site to sample is the physical safety of the location that you're traveling to. You'll always wanna have enough gloves for everybody who's going to be touching the water or performing a chemical test. You'll also want to make sure that the location that you're going to is safe. Never enter a flooded stream always make sure you have boots or waders on when you enter the stream. 
If you have boots, don't enter a stream above your ankles. If you have waders, don't enter a stream above your knees. You'll also want to make sure that you always have the appropriate permissions for students or volunteers to enter the water at the site you've chosen. When you're finished collecting your data, you can enter your results into an online searchable map hosted by Central Michigan University's H2OQ program. There, you can compare your data to data collected by other students and volunteers around the state. To check out one of the H2OQ Water Quality Backpack Labs, visit michigan.gov slash Eagle Classroom to complete a lending station request. Thanks for watching and have fun! All right. Well, thank you so much for watching and listening throughout that. Um, lots of resources, lots of information that I'll send out uh, along with our follow-up email. And Joel, you can go ahead and stop the recording now and we will move into a more discussion oriented session. So if our presenters would be willing to turn their cameras back on. Thank you.